Hello, and acids and arthropods. My name is TB Skyne, and welcome back to the boss designs of Dark Souls 2. So last time around, we found and defeated the Royal Rat Authority and Vanguard, and ended up pledging ourselves to the service of the Rat King, which unfortunately turns out to be mostly a PvP thing, so it's not going to be that relevant to this particular playthrough. But now, having completed that little adventure, and realizing that both of those rats' nests are, at least for the moment, dead ends, we're searching for something else to explore and another boss to battle. But for the moment, I suppose, let's actually go to the Royal Army campsite because that's kind of where we got after Scorpion as Nashka and never really explored any further because I got busy doing all kinds of other things. But there's a whole bunch of like dudes hanging out here and, you know, jackass archers up in towers and stuff. So presumably they're protecting something. Like, for example, that cathedral over there. And those very unusual rock formations. Hmm. Oh, okay. I, 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 I believe I sense a trap here. <laughs> oh, I, I wonder if that rock is going to come down and fall on my head. <laughs> it's, it, it rolled over him, too. Oh, my God. Dumbass. Sup? Boy, you have a lot of health. Why would you do that? I'm not down there. Flame butterfly. That sounds like a Mega Man X boss. Flame butterfly. Oh, that's a horde. This game is fond of hordes. Yeah, I don't think I can open that door. Oh, maybe I can. Spider door, huh? Are there gonna be spiders down here? Uh, I don't want there to be spiders down here. So, torch required, torch required. Be wary of bug. Okay, I don't like not dual wielding, but... I'll take the advice. Ah! <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't like spiders. Ah! <laughs> I don't like spiders. I really don't. I really extremely don't like spiders. Oh, I don't like them. You're not gonna do anything? Oh, there's so many. Okay. You're just gonna sit there, okay? You're not gonna follow me. You're gonna stay with f where the f you are. Oh, the dis uh, it's, it's not just like I, I can handle spiders in real life. But there's like those... That particular version of a spider character design is just not... Okay, if I touch the chest, they're gonna get me. That's the signal I'm getting here. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Oh, if this is a boss fight with a giant... Sp is this the giant spider? No? What the hell is this? Ah! Yeah. Hell! Excuse me? Oh, he looks cool. Albeit, I really do wish he'd not do whatever the yeah. f*** it is he's doing. Okay. Prowling Magus and Congregation. Okay. So I've almost killed the Congregation. Except... Ah, uh, they poisoned me. Great. Woo. Me sideways. 
Okay. So he's got an area clear. Oh, this is a little bit of a pinwheel situation, isn't it? I.E. Powerful magic, but not much else. Mm. Okay. That's the Magus dealt with. Well, all right then. That wasn't so hard, uh, once I stopped dying. <laughs> I thought I was dead there. Jesus, I have no magic defense. Good lord. Oh, thank god. No more spiders then. Just people. Just humans from now on. Right, game? Good. Hey, if you just got in here with a quick interruption, because while the Prowling Magus and their congregation are actually very interesting, I don't think they really contain enough to be the linchpin of a whole episode all on their own. And given that they don't drop a soul to tell me anything about them, well, there really isn't that much meat on them their bones outside of visual thematics and speculation. And speaking of visuals, let's start by looking at the congregation, because they provide an interesting contrast to the person who's leading them. The two most prominent members of the congregation are the two clerics that flank the Magus. They're dressed in fine white vestments, all whites and golds, and they occupy spaces of secondary authority flanking the Magus, but not standing in front of him. They back him up, but they aren't the primary holders of power in the little scene that we walk into. And then there are the worshippers themselves. Ragged, skinny, broken, ravaged and hollow. They are worshipping not at the altar of the goddess statue behind us in the room. They're worshipping at the feet of the Magus. Some of them are even rendered as crawling zombies pawing pathetically at the hem of the Magus's robes. This isn't a Sunday sermon from a community of faith. This is a group of terribly, terribly desperate people begging for some kind of salvation, and they are convinced that only the Magus can deliver it. Which leads us on to the prowling Magus themselves, because the Magus looks like no one else in this room, where the clerics are all wearing white and gold and carrying charms and accessories that look mostly like they're drawn from Catholicism or perhaps or Orthodox Christianity or even Judaism, the Magus is much more identified with traditional symbols of paganism. Long black robes, skeleton hands, a bony staff with skulls on it, and wearing a mask in the shape of a ram's skull, like some eldritch version of Baphomet, and even a little bit of Lovecraftian Elder God aesthetic with the billowing mass of horns extending out the back of their head. The Magus looks like every stereotypical satanic panic pagan priest or necromancer, and mismatched as he is with his impeccably dressed clerical compatriots, along with the fact that he is a prowling Magus, the sense that I get here is that this is someone who arrived in the middle of this congregation and seduced them, charmed them, tricked them, took over, inserted himself as a kind of cult leader in the middle of this group of desperate penitents, perhaps promising them some sort of salvation from the massive plague of spiders that is clearly infesting the area, or, given the context of the rest of the game and the fact that their followers all seem to be hollows, Perhaps they promised them salvation from the curse, from the hollowing, from the destruction of the self, the loss of memories, and the complete obliteration of personality that comes along with it. Perhaps, like any good cult leader, the Magist promised them salvation through belonging, a group identity as one of the faithful, even if personal identity is beginning to fade. Or maybe the Magus just brainwashed them, or maybe they're all just hollows and they decide to kill you the moment you walk into the room because that's what hollows do. Unfortunately, we have nothing concrete to base our speculation on, so all I'm giving you here is one potential reading of that tableau, that setup of the parishioners supplicating before the Magus and the Magus looking so different from the clerics that flank him that marks the Magus as some kind of an outsider. It's pure speculation, and it is informed by the reading of the game that I already have, which means that if you have a different reading of the game, you might have a very different reading of the Magus. Which is why they're not getting a whole episode to themselves, so it is time to move on. 
It's interesting. So let's move on and maybe find another bonfire. Oh, we're out. Oh, we're out. Okay. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. Uh... Aha. I don't suppose it's a good idea to jump down there. Well, I could, but I don't know why I would. What the hell is that thing? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. More spiders. Why? I saw those legs. I see you down there. Ah, on the wall. No. <laughs> why? <laughs> why more? Oh, at least they're weak. I don't like them. I'd rather fight whatever the hell that is. Oh, maybe I wouldn't. Ah! Oh, now you're gonna fall. Now you're gonna be aggro on me. Or not. Or are they gonna stay the fuck away? Okay, so the light seems to drive them off. Kind of like the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the creatures in the pirate place. Well, I'm never letting this torch go out, ever. Just torches forever. Don't know what that was. Not interested in finding out. Oh, cool. Okay, if I drop down there, I can't come back up here. Oh, there's more spiders everywhere! Why are there spiders everywhere? Why is that a thing? Oh, I don't want there to be more. I'm officially putting a moratorium on more spiders. It's not- they're not even powerful enemies, clearly. But... Oh, just skittering little legs. Oh, there's gonna be so many more spiders in here. Uh, it's gonna be full of them. Oh, no. Oh, you- Oh, I'm not- I'm not chasing it. I'm not doing it. I refuse. What the f*** is that? Is that a spider zombie? Did they mother Half-Life that mother God damn it. These are head crab spiders. <laughs> Even worse. F you. 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 Because that's my mother nightmare. Like having a spider attached to me. Like that. Oh, you piece of garbage. Oh, you piece of filth! It attacked me after it was dead. Now that's hardly fair. Yeah, you can't stagger it. Because you're hitting- I guess because you're hitting the zombie corpse? Rather than the spider? Okay. So, nothing for it at this point but to jump down here, I suppose. Oh! Oh my god! Okay, it had more range than I thought it would. I don't like those spider zombies at all. Controversial opinion, I know, but... Okay, so can I just skip ahead a little bit and jump down... ...over here? A few moments later... What the f*** just happened? Everything just happened all at once! Okay, note to self, don't jump down there! That's a bad place to jump down! So those are those basilisk creatures, but... ...with heads that are actually proportional. Oh, I hope I'm not annoying people by being so squicked out by spiders all the time. It's just, uh, it's one of my, it's one of my things. It's one of the things I just can't, 
can't not be squicked out by. Oh, that floor is spiky. Okay, is there gonna be a boss in here? Oh. Oh no. Oh god. Oh f Oh sh Oh hell. Oh damn and blast. Why are there so many? I can summon someone to help me? I would like someone to help me. Yes, please, I don't care who you are. Help! Manhunter O'Hara. Good. Kill some spiders, O'Hara. Oh, fire arrows, I love you. I like you. Just, just kill them all. Kill them, kill them, kill them, kill them, kill them, kill them, kill them. Oh, that's good. Oh, you're my new best friend. Like your skirt, too. Why are you running around in high heels? That's a lady with some style. She's dressed business casual. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, God. Spiders, man. I do not like them. Are... Are there just going to be more spiders on... Uh, what does the message on the ground say? Dark spirit ahead. Well, I have a friend now, so I feel like I can handle it. Oh! Dark spirit indeed! He was just there, waiting. Oh, mother... Don't do that. Jerk. Was he just, like, there? Homeward bone. Did he get trapped in there and die and turn into an evil spirit? What a random thing. Oof, that spider combo is brutal. Try not to get hit by it, O'Hara, please. Thank you. How many more spiders are there gonna be? Is gonna, there's gonna be a spider boss. Isn't there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look. Oh, that's webbing, isn't it? Yeah, it's supposed to be webbing. Uh, <laughs> there's gonna be a big spider in here. I've seen that. I saw that one when I was editing the intro. I did see a spider boss when I was editing the intro, so I guess I'm spoiled a little bit on what's coming, but I don't know where it is. And by the way, I'm gonna be so much more able to handle a giant spider, like a really big, ridiculously giant spider. That's gonna be no f problem. It's the little ones. It's the little small... Of course I can't walk fast on this. Of course I can't. It's the little small ones that get me. Like the ones that are, that are like that are like too big, but not like cartoon big. They're the ones I hate. Oh yeah, there's a boss door right there. Thank f for the torch. Like, thank God for them being scared of torches. I would be so... Ugh. This would have been so stressful if the spiders, in addition to just being here and being ugly and hateful, also ag were aggressive. I guess we have to go in there. I guess that's where we have to go. Why isn't there a bonfire closer than this? Ha ha ha! It was just standing there. Ooh, golden summon sign. I'm sort of torn on whether to summon the other one there. Because on the one hand, I feel like it might trivialize the boss. On the other hand, <coughs> spiders. Just f*** them. <coughs> I'm so far from a bonfire, I don't want to have to climb all the way f back down here. 
I'm taking all the help I can get. And I know that also increases um, the boss's health, I believe, to have two companions with you. But I'm okay with that. So if I'm not much mistaken... Yeah, okay. That's the trouble with editing a series like this. Like, because I need an intro, I'm inevitably spoiled that there's gonna be a spider boss in the game. And once I see all the cobwebs, of course, it's not hard to figure. <laughs> oh, the animators did a great job of animating these little... It's not hard to figure where that spider boss is gonna be. Is that a petrified dragon, by the way? Oh, you are distressingly large. And you have friends. So many friends! Oh, I don't like that camera angle at all. The Dukes, dear Freya. What the hell does that mean? Okay, that doesn't do anything. Ah! Okay, they're busy fighting the little ones. I'm okay with that. I'm all right with that. Okay, so how do I hurt you? Oh, I have to hit the head. Great. Great. I'm just gonna do some poison resistance! Wait, what's that? Oh, there it is. That's the head. Nope. Now, the Duke's dear Freya. The Duke. We've met a Duke before in Dark Souls. Oh, okay, he finishes that up with a... Okay. We have met a duke before in Dark Souls. Indeed, we have. Okay, the torch does nothing. Nothing whatsoever. I feel like maybe a fire weapon will... ...do more. Plus, it's faster. Nope, not especially. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, the legs on this thing are cool as balls. Like, look at that. They're, uh, they're disgusting and terrifying and awful, but I really like the exaggerated stylization of the spider. It has two heads. It's a double-headed sp- it's- Again, again, a creature split in two. A creature with two distinct halves, identities, heads. It's been a motif in this game. I should stop getting hit by that. Fine, bastard sword it is. Whoa. Try not to die, Boyd. Yeah, I had no way out of that. Ah! Flash! I couldn't get past its... its pit... its, uh, mouth... Pieces. It's it's mouth bits. Okay. Well, no more Boyd to tank things for me. Ah. Oh, it's two spiders. It's two spiders connected by the back of their abdomen. That's basically what's going on here. But anyway, we know about... Why did none of that hit him? Her. Presumably this is a matriarch. I'm a little annoyed that... There we go. 
Okay, yeah, no, I don't regret summoning for that one. Oh my god. The Duke's dear Freya. And also, what the hell is that? Great soul. Did I get two souls from this thing? What on earth? Soul of the Duke's dear Freya, the Writhing Ruin's Keeper. The Writhing Ruin is an ancient thing whose shadow remains cast over the land. It first took possession of a solitary insect, but grew its power, feasting on the wealth of twisted souls found in the land. Use the special soul of the Keeper to acquire numerous souls. So, there's a petrified dragon in here, right? Is that Seath? It certainly doesn't... He certainly has doesn't have any eyes. And it's all scaled over. I mean, that wouldn't make a lot of sense, because I killed Seath. And horns. It doesn't look like Seath did when he was fully crystallized, so it probably isn't him. And it, oh, it's an enemy. I mean... A library. Fragrant branch of your Brightstone Key Dark Quartz Ring. I mean, there is a not- so, is that the Duke, then? Is that who that's supposed to be? Poor soul ahead, therefore pull back. Is that the Duke, then? Okay, well, that would make a little bit more sense. Something broke out of that cage. The spider? So what we're- so are we meant to infer, basically, that... That's the Duke. His dear Freya was in there. Was taken over by a great soul, or by the writhing something-something. And eventually came out here. And are we then to infer that the great soul came from the dragon? Because a dragon would have a great soul. Interesting. I guess that's what the environmental storytelling is saying. Let's see, what about that ring I got? A ring bestowed on students of a certain standard, the Melfian Magic Academy, its dark infused quartz increases dark defense. Okay, so that's nothing. The eccentric Lord Seldora, known for his fascination with spiders, ah, I see, built a town and a personal fortune by mining Brightstone. One day the town was overrun by spiders, but Lord Seldora only stood by and watched, eerily contented. So, Lord Seldora was Duke Seldora? I suppose? And he engineered... Well, no, he can't have intentionally set Freya free. Because that cage was broken from the inside. Hmm, interesting. A lot of environmental storytelling here. Especially, like, with this immaculately well-maintained library that this... Yeah. Uh, kept for himself. So is this key going to unlock that door? I mean, I can't get up there anymore, surely. But there was that door in the in the hole before I came here. Hmm. There's no bonfire anywhere near here, which annoys me because it means I won't be like if if I leave, I'm not going to be able to come back and check out any other things. Let's go check if there isn't a bon- Maybe there's a bonfire on the other side of, of the, the Lord's room. Because I just killed- I just embraced a great soul. Ah. <laughs> yeah. And again. With the broken bonfire, which is a primal bonfire, and this giant-ass room that just looks like a trap. I swear to God, like, one of those primal bonfires is gonna be a trap. One of them is gonna be a trap. Like, you can't design a room like that with, a th like, one little broken bonfire that looks kinda wrong in the middle of it. And it not be a thing. Like... Like, I'm gonna touch a bonfire and a boss is gonna drop on my head or something. Alright.
Everything cool? Okay. Let's go back to Majula. Hello. I have embraced the great soul. The soul and the curse are one and the same. Your soul has grown stronger still. Really? Great. I only hope it brings you what you wish. Well, right now I wish for more dexterity, so... Ooh. Oh, that looks fancy. So, regular ass attacks. And then... <laughs> oh, yes! Overhead swings. I like overhead swings. <laughs> Yay. That was the Duke's dear Freya. Or Freya. Uh, if, you, if you were to pronounce that in Danish, F-R-E-J-A, it would be Freya. Um, who seems to be a tiny spider that was unleashed on the world by the negligence, or perhaps the active abetment of a lord who sacrificed all of his workers to the machine of industry. Which, oh hey, capitalism metaphor. I bet Future Sky is going to have a lot of fun with that, and I'm going to let him get on with it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paskine, but I think we're going to start from a slightly different angle. So as I noted during the fight, the beloved Freya is yet another example of a boss who is in some way split. Like the Flexile Sentry, like Scorpionus Nashka, here we have a boss who's split between two halves. But what's interesting about Freya is that here there is no distinction between one half or another. The Flexile Sentry carried different weapons and had on different armor. Scorpionus Nashka was a very clear split between her human parts and her scorpion parts, but with Freya, one head, at least as far as I could tell, is exactly the same as the other. They are a perfectly symmetrical split. Which is interesting because so far we've been discussing the split in terms of some kind of internal division or conflict within the design. Like the split as a thematic element of the character design is supposed to symbolize some level of internal opposition between two parts of a character. That, however, does not seem to exist with Freya. She, or they, are in perfect synchronization with each other to the point where if she turns around a couple of times, you don't actually know which head was where just a second ago. They move identically. They seem to have absolutely identical attacks and they seem to work at completely identical purpose. So if I insist on continuing to read the visual metaphor of a split character design in Dark Souls 2 as a visual representation of different kinds of identity conflict within the self, what do I do with a character who is split but seems to suffer no internal conflict whatsoever? Well, we obviously have to change our perspective a little bit. So the Flexile Sentry is clearly two individuals who are trapped on the same pair of legs and therefore they consciously work together with one another. Scorpionus Nashka, on the other hand, is clearly two distinct entities, the human part and the scorpion part, but one part has completely taken over. Nashka has fallen to the scorpion, whereas her husband Tart seems to be dominated by his human half. The Duke's beloved Freya, then, is the third possible combination. First, two distinct individuals who are working together while being separate entities. Second, one entity completely taking over another. And then third, two entities in such complete harmony that they become one. When you ask the question, who is the Duke's beloved Freya, the answer is, they both are. The combination of the two is what constitutes the creature, the identity, known as the Duke's beloved Freya. They are not at all distinct from one another. They are physically identical. They are completely symmetrical. There's no conflict. There's no difference. They are like cells in a body. Each of them individually do not constitute the whole person, but in combination with one another, they make up something complete. And this raises the question, if you killed half of the Duke's beloved Freya, what would the other half be? And that's a weird and kind of esoteric question, but, well, follow me down the rabbit hole on this one. Think of the merchant, Maulin the Armorer, who we talked to in the last episode. 
When we begin the game and talk to him for the first time, he's a timid little man who has come from a land far away where he couldn't do business and who traveled to Drang Lake in the hopes of striking gold and being rich. He talks a lot about his homeland and how things there were bad and what kind of life he led there. But now, at this point in the game, he has done enough business that he has become rich. And now, when we talk to him, not only is all his timid little stammering his, oh, uh, yes, hello, please do come again. Not only is that gone, that part of how he presented himself as a person, he has also lost his memory of his home, where he came from. He doesn't even really know why he's here anymore. Like other characters in the game, he's going hollow and losing the memories of who he used to be. And so the question here for me is, when does Maulin the Armorer, the person, the timid little man we meet at the beginning of the game, stop being Maulin the Armorer? How much of someone can you take away before they are not that someone anymore? How many memories can you lose? How many parts of yourself can go away? before you cease to be the person that you were, before you effectively become someone entirely new. If you cut off half of the Duke's beloved Freya, will the remaining half still be the Duke's beloved Freya, or has too much been lost? Can they only be the true beloved Freya when they are together and the moment you cut them apart, they become distinct separate entities? This stuff, again, is the kind of wanky first year philosophy, doesn't it make you think kind of questioning, but it's also a really fundamental question when it comes to discussions of human identity. How much of me can change before I'm not me anymore? I am certainly not the person I was 10 years ago. I might not even be the person I was five years ago. Maulin isn't who he was at the start of the game, and neither is my character. When they started out the game, they were, first of all, male with a magnificent mustache. That's not true anymore. They were also a shield warrior with aspirations towards pyromancy, and now they're a complete dual wielder. And if I wanted to, I could go right back to the witches and say, hey, I'm tired of being a dual wielder. Make me a sorcerer. Make me a cleric. Make me an archer. Make me a thief. By the end of this game, my character will be utterly unrecognizable to the character that started it out. And what the Duke's beloved Freya invites me to consider is both how much of myself constitutes who I was, how much of myself can I remove before I am no longer that person, but it also asks me to consider, hey, hang on, what if you could have an identity that's made up by more than one you? The Duke's beloved Freya manages to be one despite being two, couldn't I also be one in spite of being two or three or four or five or eight different identities? Couldn't all of that, all the different identities I have occupied, all the different versions of myself I have gone through, if you added them all together, couldn't they just add up to one me? Anyway, that is less a reading of the Duke's beloved Freya specifically, and more a reading of all of these split character designs, and the fact that I can completely change my spec as a character, and the fact that I can change the biological sex and gender of my character, and the fact that we're dealing with multiple characters in this game who seem to transition from one state of identity into another through the loss of memory. And the thing about these kinds of broad, overarching readings where you're trying to incorporate as much as possible into your understanding is that they can sometimes get pretty esoteric and they can reach pretty far outside of the work itself, the video game that we're actually playing, in order to establish their themes. So, before we close this video, let's talk a little bit more specifically about the Duke's beloved Freya and try to read it more against the internal context of Dark Souls. Let's talk about the Duke who raised it, the town of Sildora, where it lived, and the writhing ruin that infected it. So as far as I can make out from the information that I have available, Freya was once upon a time just another spider, perhaps a two-headed one, which would explain why the Duke Seldora took an interest in her, for he had a fascination with spiders. But there was something else special about the Duke's dear Freya, because unbeknownst to anyone, she was the host of a very 
old soul, the writhing ruin, an ancient thing whose shadow remains cast over the land, hiding in the form of the Duke's beloved Freya, it began feasting on the wealth of twisted souls found in the land. Seldora, you see, was not merely a town, but a mining operation. Built by the Duke to extract bright stone from under the earth, perhaps generated by the corpse of an ancient dragon, and sold to the masses as an opportunity for wealth and economic freedom if only you give your labor to the sharp fields of jutting crystals in the mines beneath Seldora. And the writhing ruin feasted on the souls of those who came, and feasted perhaps on the duke himself. Peasants, miners, farmers, clerics, soldiers, and guards, all of them come to Seldora seeking a better life, and all of them become food for the twisted greed of the writhing ruin who grows fat inside the little cage in the duke's study until it can be contained no longer and makes its home instead in the corpse of an ancient god, a dead dragon. And there, it spawns its brood in silence. And so the corruption grows under Brightstone Cove, with the residents above none the wiser, working away in the Brightstone mines and never really noticing if one or two or ten of them go missing in the deeper parts every once in a while. All this wealth is surely worth the risk, right? Freya's brood grows, and so does their hunger, their need to consume, and Seldora stands by and watches, eerily contented. Perhaps another victim of the influence of the writhing ruin, perhaps just a weirdo who is really happy to have found so many unique and interesting spiders. Whatever the case, no one is ready when the brood overruns Seldora, when all the greedy little children of the Duke's dear Freya emerge from the ground and kill the inhabitants of Seldora, at least those who haven't gone hollow themselves already, and parasitize their corpses as yet another vessel for the greed of the writhing ruin. The few hollows that remain unconsumed are still going through the motions, hacking away at the stone that promised them wealth but took everything. They walk through fields of sharpened crystals, tearing them to ribbons, still chasing that hint of hope of a better life. And all the while, the Duke's dear Freya grows and feasts and eats and consumes a poisonous, disgusting, two-faced parasite only concerned with consuming, with growing, with accumulating only to itself that which once belonged to others. In the world of Drang Lake, the disease that claimed Seldora is named the Writhing Ruin. But in our world, we recognize it by the name of capitalism. Yeah, I bet you wish I'd go back to the esoteric thought experiments now, don't ya? Thank you very much for watching another episode of The Boss Designs of Dark Souls 2. If you have enjoyed this video, then you can hit the like, comment, and subscribe buttons down below, because that makes YouTube numbers go up, and numbers going up is the only thing that YouTube really cares about. Now, if you would like to help me survive more efficiently under the dominant economic system of the Western neoliberal imperial hegemony, well, I also have a merchandise store where you can get yourself like a nice mug or a comfortable shirt with something that's vaguely related to my channel printed on it. You can also support the boss designs of Dark Souls 2, especially on Patreon or via the tip jars down in the description, and I kind of rely on that a little bit for this particular series because, well, Dark Souls content isn't exactly the most popular thing in the algorithm, and it doesn't exactly bring in a lot of advertising revenue. So, if you think this series is cool and you would like me to be able to make as much of it as possible, then direct support is definitely the best way to help, closely followed by sharing these videos with people who you think might be interested in them, posting them around on discords or in subreddits that you frequent on the assumption 
information that you think that they are good and that other people might be interested in watching them. If you don't want to support me or the channel directly, that's of course completely okay, but I will encourage you here at the end of my video to consider supporting content creators whose work you enjoy directly. Whether it's me or someone else, for online content creators, a single dollar's donation can be the same as literally thousands of views on a video on YouTube. Especially for smaller content creators, those tiny little early donations are not only a lot of help in terms of making some money off of their hard work, it is also a tremendous moral support. So even if you can only afford to give a single dollar or two, please consider doing so whenever you can, because it matters so much more than you think. Anyway, that's all my lecturing and preaching out of the way, and if you haven't enjoyed any of that, well, then I encourage you to make use of the dislike button down below. However, I must remind you, comrade, that the Central Party Committee has only allotted each of us a single dislike per day, and any worker found to be in excess of their spending limit will have their dislike license revoked, and you will have to apply to the Central Committee for permission to apply for a permission to petition the Central Subcommittee for a permission to renew your license. Thank you very much for watching.